What other books do we have? Two more. Dweamer History and Culture. And History of Lockpicking. No, I, let's start with this one. I'm not sure if I've read that one already. Um, but let's just start reading it. It is 10 pages. Collected Essays on Dweamer History and Culture, Chapter 1. Uh, maybe I've read another book of the same... Yeah, I know I've read another one because I know that name. Hasfat Antabolis, he's known for Morrowind. Marabar Sul and the Trivialization of the Dweamer in Popular Culture. I think I've read... Uh, the other book I've read was about the story of a man who excavated a Dweamer ruin. And had slaves. Something like that. Anyway, this is chapter 1. While Marabar Sul's ancient tales of the Dweamer was defini definitively debunked in scholarly circles as early as the reign of Kataraya I, it remains one of the staples of the literate middle classes of the empire and has served to set the image of the Dweamer in the popular imagination for generations of school children. What about his lengthy but curiously ins insubstantial tome has proved so captivating to the public that it has been able to see off both the scorn of the literati and the scathing critiques of the scholars? Before examining this question, a brief summary of the provenance and subsequent career of ancient tales would be appropriate. First published around 2nd era, 670, in the Interregnum, between the fall of the First Cyrodiilic Empire and the rise of Tiber Septim, it was originally presented as a serious scholarly work based on the research in the archives of the University of Gwilym, and in the chaos of that era was taken at face value, a sign of the sad state of Dwemer scholarship in those years, Little is known of the author, but Marobar Sul was most likely a pseudonym of Gorfalim, a prolific writer of penny dreadful romances of that era who is known to have used many other pseudonyms. While most of Felim's other work has thankfully been lost to history, what little survives matches ancient tales in both language and tone. See Lomis' textual comparison of Gorfalim's hypothetical treachery with Marobar Sul's ancient tales of the Dweamer, that's a mouthful. Felim lived in Cyrodiil his whole life, writing light entertainments for the lead of the old imperial capital. Why he decided to turn his hand to the Dweamer is unknown, but it is clear that his research consisted of nothing more than collecting the peasant's tales of the Nibene Valley and recasting them in Dweamer guise. The book proved popular in Cyrodiil, and Felim continued to churn out more volumes until the series numbered seven in all. Ancient Tales of the Dweamer was thus firmly established as a local favorite in Cyrodiil, already in its 17th printing, when the historical forces that propelled Tiber Septim to prominence also began to spread the literature of the heartland across the continent. Marabar Sol's version of the Dweamer was seized upon in the search of human racial nationalism that has not yet subsided. The Dweamer appear in these tales as creatures of fable and light fantasy, but in general they are just like us. They come across as a bit eccentric, perhaps, but certainly there is nothing fearsome or dangerous about them. Compare these to the Dweamer of early Redguard legend, a mysterious powerful race capable of bending the very laws of nature to their will, vanished but perhaps not gone. Were the Dweamer portrayed in the most ancient Nord sagas, fearsome warriors tainted by blasphemous religious practices, who used their profane mechanisms to drive the Norse from Morrowind? Marabar Sul's Dweamer were much more amenable to the spirit of the time, which saw humans as the pinnacle of creation and the other races as unenlightened barbarians or imperfect lesser versions of humans eager for tutelage. Ancient Tales falls firmly in the latter camp, which does much to explain its enduring hold on the popular imagination. Marabar Sul's Dweamer are so much more comfortable, so much friendlier, so much more familiar than the real Dweamer, whose truly mysterious nature we are only beginning to understand. The public prefers the light, trivial version of this vanished race. And from what I have learned in my years of studying the Dweamer, I have some sympathy for that preference. As the following essays will show, the Dweamer were, to our modern eyes, a remarkable, unlikely people in many ways. Like I said, I've read another chapter uh, somewhere um, in my previous videos. I forgot the name of it though. I think it was Ruins of Camel Z. I think that's it. Alright, what about the other book? History of Lockpicking. I was expecting some skill in lockpicking. But no skill book. 
How many pages is this? Eight. I like the short ones. The modern lock has a fascinating history in Sierra Dill. The need to restrict access to one's home has been a problem since homes were first built. The very first security system was a simple bar across the door. This has the obvious shortcoming of only being functional when the owner is at home. The first recorded instance of a lock is the ingenious arm breaker of Castle Anvil. The count of the day put five slight bars on the side of the door. A hole in the door just above them allowed him to reach in and manipulate any of these bars. Only one of the bars truly locked or unlocked the door. The other four released the clasp, the clasp on a hammer that fell down on the person's arm. Only by knowing which sliding bar is a true lock could one safely open the door. <laughs> well, I would be very scared to open my, my own door if that were the case. For over a hundred years, the state of the art in locks was defined by sliding bars and punished traps. Then the famous dwarf Mzunchent invented the pin lock. The first example had three pins. The key was turned into the lock four times, each turn depending on a different pin being in position. Obviously, a pin could be used more than once. It was 65 years before anyone devised a method to open the pin-based lock without the key and without damaging the lock. It wasn't that the problem was so difficult. It was that nobody other than royalty could afford Mzunchen's locks. An enterprising blacksmith named Orenthal decided to mass-produce a common form of the lock at a reasonable price. Suddenly every shop had a lock. Now there was a reason to subvert the locks. It wasn't long before lockpicks and lockpicking appeared. Orenthal became quite wealthy inventing more and more sophisticated locks. Today's locks are sophisticated mechanisms with spring-loaded pins. Each metal pin must be pushed open by the key precisely to open the lock. Any imprecision in the key, any poorly made copy or any clumsy attempt to add lock picking releases the spring tension causing the pin to clamp down upon or even break the key or lock pick. Locks are made more secure by using multiple pins in the lock. Multiple pin locks are more delicate and difficult to make and more expensive but provide a greater reliability against tampering. Multiple pin locks have the further virtue of resetting all pins when any single pin is tampered with. A single mistake with a fifth pin of, of a five pin lock requires a thief to reset all five pins again. Most affordable locks are one pin or two pin locks. The five pin lock is the highest achievement of the locksmith's craft, the greatest challenge to a would be intruder. That applies to us. Picking the modern lock is an art form. A lock pick is a thin metal bar with a small tooth on the end. The tooth is used to press the pin up into a lock mechanism. The thief uses skill and experience to manipulate each pin in turn to determine the exact tension necessary to set the spring loaded pin at its catch point. With a solid pressing and lifting off the pin, the master thief determines the exact motion required to set it. A novice thief breaks many picks while learning his trade. Only with time and practice will he get better at guessing the tension and timing necessary to set a pin. As a result, novice thieves tend to carry a great many lockpicks, while the masters only need to carry a few. I think I'm already somewhere in between. I don't like the lockpicking in the Oblivion. It's a uh, much better in uh, Skyrim or in Fallout games but yeah it's better than in Morrowind I think that was just trial and error and based on skill purely so with that I think I've read all the books that are to read in here it was a crazy endeavor but I like reading books as you can tell already by now I think and it like I said before it, it gives you a great backstory of this game now this dude has more books yes in his inventory but i'm out of money so, no i don't want to persuade you i want to barter can i interest you in some of my wares i have six gold and he sells all kinds of books some are quite cheap let's go check the ones i haven't read yet just to check them off I still have yet to read more brief histories of the Empire. I could buy them though. I'm not sure if I've read two already. Or that I... I think I've read two already. You know what? I think I've read them all. That's idiotic. They are right here in the shop. So I think I've read them all. Cleansing of the Fane. I'm not sure. This is just a document, not a book. I think I've read it also. 
Um, fundaments. It would be logical that all these books are on display somewhere in the shop, but hanging gardens? I don't think I've read that one yet. Can't afford it. Um, modern heretics. Same applies for this one. Haven't read it yet. Report disaster at Ionith. I don't think I've read that one yet, so I could buy it. It's only two gold. Um, the armor's challenge. Don't know about that one yet. I think I've read the Book of Daedra. Last King of Alates. Yeah, the real Berenzia. The Waters of Oblivion. That sounds interesting, but it's way too expensive. And I've read that one. So let's buy the only one I can afford. I haven't read one yet. That's it. That is Report Disaster at Ionith for two gold. And that's really. Tell it. your friends about me. I don't have them yet, but I will do once Good I have. Good day. Good day. What do you have inside the chest? Well, it's not worth looking. I just can't, can't take them out if there are any books in there. So cleansing of the faint. I'm just checking over here. I know I've read all of these. Cleansing of the faint. Yeah, I've read it. Brothers of Morrock. It's a four volume one. All right. So one more book to read before we finally head out. This is the book I just acquired. Uh, this one. I can drop this one because I've read them all. Voila, I can't sell it to him because it was stolen. The Book of Daedra, I don't really need that anymore, do I? I could sell it, but no, it's not worth much. The rest I will keep. Report of the Imperial Commission on the Disaster at Ionith. Lord Portrait Chairman, Part 1, Preparations. How long is it? Holy cow, that's a long book. So I think I'm going to split it in two videos, maybe. But well, let's just start reading. Again. The Emperor's plans for the invasion of Akavir were laid in the 270s, when he began the conquest of the small island kingdoms that lie between Tamriel and Akavir. With the fall of Black Harbor and Esroniad in 282, Uriel V was already looking ahead to the ultimate prize. He immediately ordered extensive renovations to the port, which would serve as the marshalling point for the invasion force and as the main supply source throughout the campaign. At this time he also began the construction of the many large ocean-going transports that would be needed for the final crossing to Akavir, in which the navy was previously deficient. Thus it can be seen that the Emperor's preparations for the invasion were laid well in advance before even the conquest of Esroniad was complete and was not a sudden whim as some have charged. When Prince Bashomon yielded Esroniad to Imperial authority in 284, the Emperor's full attention could be devoted to planning for the Akaviri campaign. Naval expeditions were dispatched in 285 and 86 to scout the sea lanes and coastlands of Akavir, and various Imperial intelligence agents, both magical and mundane, were employed to gather information. On the basis of all this information, the Kingdom of the Tsaishi in the southwest of Akavir was selected as the initial target for the invasion. Meanwhile, the Emperor was gathering his expeditionary force. A new Far East fleet was created for the campaign, which for a time dwarfed the rest of the navy. It is said to be the most powerful fleet ever assembled in the history of Tamriel. The 5th, 7th, 10th and 14th legions were selected for the initial landing, with the 9th and 17th to follow as reinforcements once the beachhead was secured. While this may seem to the laymen a relatively small fraction of the army's total manpower, it must be remembered that this expeditionary force would have to be maintained at the end of a long and tenuous supply line. In addition, the Emperor and the Army Command believed that the invasion would not be strongly supposed, opposed at least at first. Perhaps most crucially, the Navy had only enough heavy transport capacity to move four legions at a time. It should be noted here that the Commission does not find fault with the Emperor's preparations for the invasion. Based on the information available prior to the invasion, which, while obviously deficient in hindsight, 
great effort had been made to accumulate. The commission believes that the emperor did not act recklessly or imprudently. Some have argued that the expeditionary force was too small. The commission believes that on the contrary, even if shipping could have been found to transport and supply more legions, an impossibility without crippling the trade of the entire empire, this would have merely added to the scale of the disaster. It would not have averted it. Neither could the rest of the empire be denuded of legions. The memory of the Comorn usurper was still fresh and the emperor believed, and this commission agrees, that the security of the empire precluded a larger concentration of military force outside of Tamriel. If anything, the commission believes that the expeditionary force was too large. So this is like a report, an evaluation. Despite the creation of two new legions during his reign and the rec recreation of the fifth, the loss of the expeditionary force left the empire in a dangerously weak position relative to the provinces, as the current situation makes all too clear. This suggests that the invasion of Akavir was beyond the empire's current strength. Even if the emperor could have fielded a main and maintained a large force in Akavir, the empire may have disintegrated behind him. Part 2. The Invasion of Akavir The expeditionary force left Black Harbor on 23rd Reign's Hand, 288, and with fair weather landed in Akavir after six weeks at sea. The landing site was a small Seishi port at the mouth of a large river, chosen for its proximity tam to Tamriel, as well as its location in a fertile river valley, giving easy access to the interior as well as good foraging for the army. All went well at first. The Seishi had abandoned the town when the expeditionary force approached, so they took possession of it and renamed it Septimia, the first colony of the new imperial province of Akavir. While the engineers fortified the town and expanded the port facilities to serve the Far East fleet, the emperor marched inland with two legions. The surrounding land was reported to be rich, well-watered fields, and meeting no resistance, the army took the next city upriver, also abandoned. This was refounded as Eonith, and the emperor established his headquarters there, being much larger than Septimia and better located to dominate the surrounding countryside. The expeditionary force had yet to meet any real resistance, although the legions were constantly shadowed by mounted enemy patrols which prevented any but large scouting parties from leaving the main body of the army. One thing the emperor sorely lacked was cavalry, due to the limited space on the transport fleet, although for the time being the battle mages made up for this with magical reconnaissance. The emperor now sent out envoys to try to contact the Tsaishi king or whoever ruled this land, but his messengers never returned. In retrospect, the commission believes that valuable time was wasted in this effort while the army was stalled at Ionith, which could have been better spent in advancing quickly while the enemy was still apparently surprised by the invasion. However, the emperor believed at the time that Tetsaishi could be overwrought by the empire's power and he, and he might win a province by negotiation with no need for serious fighting. Meanwhile, the four legions were busy building a road between Septimia and Ionith setting up fortified guard posts along the river and fortifying both cities' defenses activities which would serve them well later. They're just like the Roman Empire, aren't they? Due to their lack of cavalry, scouting was limited and communication between the two cities constantly threatened by enemy raiders with which the legions were still unable to come to grips. So at least there was some resistance. The original plan had been to bring the two reinforcing legions across as soon as the initial landing had secured the port, but the fateful decision was now taken to delay their arrival and instead begin using the fleet to transport colonists. The emperor and the council agreed that, due to the complete abandonment of the conquered area by its native population, colonists were needed to work the fields so that the expeditionary force would not have to rely entirely on the fleet for supplies. In addition, unrest had broken out in Inislia, athwart the supply route to Akavir, and the council believed the 9th and 17th legions would be better used in repacifying those territories and securing the expeditionary force supply lines. Civilian colonists, colonists and their supplies began arriving in Septimia in mid hearthfire and they took over the preparation of the fields, which had been started by the legionnaires, for a spring crop. A number of cavalry mounts were also brought over at this time, and the raids on the two imperial colonies subsequently fell off. Tsaishia emissaries also finally arrived in Ionith, purportedly to begin peace negotiations, and the expeditionary force settled in for what was expected to be a quiet winter. 
At this time, the council urged the emperor to return to Tamriel with the fleet to deal with many pressing matters of the empire while the army was in winter quarters, but the emperor decided that it would be best to remain in Akavir. This turned out to be fortunate because a large portion of the fleet, including the emperor's flagship, was destroyed by an early winter storm during the homeward voyage. The winter storm season of 82 and 89 was unusually prolonged and exceptionally severe, and prevented the fleet from returning to Akavir as planned with additional supplies. This was reported to the Emperor via battle mage, and it was agreed to the expeditionary force could survive on what supplies it had on hand until the spring. And with that, I stop the video for now, and I'll read the next part, part 3, the next time.